Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Australian Space Discovery Centre's Q&A with the Space Expert. My name is Nathan Wildey. I am a space communicator here at the Australian Space Discovery Centre, part of the Australian Space Agency. Uh, and I'm very, very excited to uh, have a chat today with Kerry Doherty, a space historian and our Senior Heritage and Outreach Officer here at the Australian Space Agency. Before we uh, continue, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the lands of the traditional lands of the Ghana people, uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to their spiritual elders of the past, the present and the future. Uh, the Australian Space Agency's logo, in fact, is an amalgamation of different uh, First Nations constellations and the stories that they tell. Uh, and there's some fascinating history there. Over 60,000 years of astronomy have been done on these lands right here. That's 60,000 years of history. Uh, and today I'm very, very excited to be chatting with a space historian. Uh, Kerry Doherty uh, has had a very varied career throughout space uh, and uh, working through museums and archeology span and, and just has such a wonderful story of her life. Uh, and, and some of the stuff she's done with science fiction has, has been truly interesting and, and intriguing and can't wait to um, get this out to you guys today. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Kerry Doherty to our conversation. Welcome, Kerry. Thank you, Nathan. Glad to be Thank here today. So tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, your life and, and how you came to be where you are, the career path that, that has taken you here. Um, and I believe you were actually born when, when Sputnik went up. Is, is that correct? Yes, um, if we can move to our first slide, there we go. I like to say that I was born with the space age in 1957. So I went, that means you can figure out how old I am. <laughs> and uh, I was actually three months old when Sputnik 1 was launched and I was taken out to see it. I don't remember it, unfortunately. Uh, and the family joke was that um, Sputnik was sending out rays that actually somehow affected me and, and I became a, uh, a space fanatic at a very young age. And in fact, I really fell in love with space in 1959. Uh, that's when I was listening on the radio to a report that uh, Soviet space probe Luna 3 had sent back the first images of the far side of the moon. And there was something that was just so intriguing about that to my little toddler brain that literally it, it was like my epiphany, you know, something in my brain said, I want to know more about this. And that's where that's where I really got uh, fascinated with uh, with space. Lovely. And, and so how did that lead towards a career working in the space industry? Did, did you always work in the space industry? No, it was a rather long and tortuous route. Um, through many different side alleys. Uh, during the 60s, I discovered not only my passion for space, but my enduring love for science fiction. And you'll see I have uh, a slide uh, image there from uh, Thunderbirds, which is one of my uh, favorite uh, shows from my childhood. Um, I also became great, you know, passionately interested in archaeology and cultural studies. And I acquired what I call my love of learning. It's it's one of my other great interests is that I just love learning stuff. Um, I think the world is a fascinating place. The universe is an amazing place and I love learning about it. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I think we'll see some of the, the learning that you have done there. Um, there. There's quite a varied bit of education here. Um, talk, <laughs> talk us through what we're seeing on the slide. Well, I wanted to talk about my a little bit about my university career and, and some of the part time work and the activities I did, because all of that contributed along the way to uh, ultimately my winding up at the um, at the space agency through a very long detour into the museum sector. But um, university, I actually started in 76. I did want to become an astronomer, but for various reasons, I finally decided on a career change to my second love, which was archaeology and heritage studies, because back in that in those days, you couldn't actually do any degree that let you study science fiction. Well, that's what I, well, that's what I would have done. So along the way, I picked up a degree in archaeology, a graduate uh, diploma in uh, information management, specialising in archives administration, and then some uh, qualifications in public history as well, and a whole lot of miscellaneous studies along the way. So I did chemistry and geology and remote sensing and, and you know, heritage building restoration, um, a whole lot of different things, whatever took my fancy where I could fit it in. 
Um, and as I keep saying, one day I'll finish my PhD. <laughs> But um, yeah, I did a lot of different part time jobs, which of course was a lot more common in those days, I think, for young people. And I came from a large family, so if I wanted money to buy books, I had to go out and earn it. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I, I realised through my uh, professional life was, that in fact, I learned a lot of a lot of things through those different um, part time jobs that I had as a kid and through my university years that actually came in handy at different times through my uh, through my professional life. Yeah, it's quite interesting that um, a number of people that work here at the Space Agency, in particular the Space Discovery Centre, have a very varied background um, and not everybody has gone through the traditional space studies of university or then on to, to some of the, the work experience um, uh, to get into the space industry. Um, if we could have a, a look at the next slide, please. No, before um, we go, no, we'll oh, yes, talk, I have to talk about some of my activities because this is really important too. Oh, um, yes. Because, you know, science fiction, a university, of course, I discovered organised science fiction fandom. And so this was um, another part of uh, my life that became very important through my professional career. Uh, I helped to found the Australasian Doctor Who fan club, which is the world's oldest continuing Doctor Who uh, fan club, and uh, did a lot of uh, organising of things like science fiction conventions, even protested outside the ABC there when they were going to, um, we thought they were going to stop buying Doctor Who for Australia. Um, and in fact, eventually that led me to being a co-author on the Doctor Who Visual Dictionary when they rebooted the series. So. How fascinating. Um, you, you do love your, your science fiction and you've written a, a number of books on, on popular science fiction from, from Star Wars and, and, and whatnot. How do you think science fiction helps direct uh, the public's interest or provide inspiration for the public regarding space and the space industry? Well, I think the, uh, I mean, of course, science fiction can um, provide a lot of misinformation, <laughs> but at the same, you know, it gives people some funny ideas sometimes about what space activities are about, but what it provides is inspiration. You know, good science fiction provides you with wonderful ideas to think about. It provides a vision of not just escapism, but um, the thrill of exploration. And that's part of, uh, part of the broader picture of space activities. Um, it provides us with uh, some understanding or, or some, what's the word I want to hear, a vicarious um, experience of challenge. In fact, something a lot of people don't have in their lives these days is, is challenge. And uh, challenge is actually very psychologically good for you to fit yourself against something that you didn't think you could do or that would be very difficult to do. And science fiction helps us to get that window on a challenge of understanding more about the universe, of maybe at one point in the future, actually being able to step out into that universe and face the challenges we will need to face to get to Mars or beyond that and then maybe one day beyond the solar system. So science fiction brings all of those things to us and it said, would this be fantastic? And although there's a lot of that we can't do yet, it inspires us to um, strive in the longer term to perhaps achieve some of those uh, challenges of moving further out into space. Yeah, definitely to, to push some of those boundaries. One thing I love about science fiction is that it often, in many cases, predates science fact. Um, and you can have, you know, way back in the 60s with the Star Trek show, they had handheld communicators. These days we have our mobile phones, our cell phones. Um, and I just find it fascinating that uh, the creative minds of the past can give us a glimpse, glimpse into what may be possible in the future. Um, mm. um, I want to talk briefly a little bit about your working career. If we could have a look at the next slide, please. Because um, you've, you've had a fascinating uh, a professional career here as well. Could you talk us through some of what we're seeing on the screen, please? Yeah, well, I actually started um, with that sort of varied background that I have. In 1983, I started work at the Powerhouse Museum for what was supposed to be uh, four months. Um, cataloguing the uh, artefacts that were in the Sydney Observatory, which had just been closed down as a functioning observatory and was being taken over by the uh, Powerhouse Museum to be created into 
a museum of Australian astronomy. And so that uh, my knowledge of astronomy, my interest in space, and of course my uh, my skills in the art archiving area and uh, more broadly in archaeology uh, sort of got me that first job. And from there, I was able to get involved in a number of other projects during the period that the powerhouse was being developed. And as part of that, it was decided to add a space exhibition to the uh, the mix of exhibitions that were going to be included in the uh, in the new museum. And uh, <clears throat> because I had never made any secret of how interested I was in uh, in space exploration and um, the broader space activities, I was asked if I would take on developing that exhibition. And so that's um, that's what I did for the next several years. I uh, developed initially what was the world's first, uh, it's actually a world first exhibition in bringing together, remembering this is the 80s, this is the Cold War, bringing together examples of the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, Europe, the United States and Australia all in the one exhibition. And even the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum had not managed to do that at that, uh, at that time. So that was a world first for us at the powerhouse. Um, and I, I later did, um, that's the exhibition you can actually see there in the image on the upper left. And on the right of the screen, you can actually see the second version, which I redeveloped oh, along with the team. Of course, I'm not doing all of this myself. You know, we had a, an enormous team of wonderful designers and uh, exhibition builders, um, you know, all, all our uh, support staff, our conservators and everything. Um, but then we worked on it, we reworked the original exhibition and created a new version of the space exhibition, which included that photo you can see there of me between the two pictures of the exhibition. I'm inside the space hab, uh, sorry, the space lab. And this was again, um, uh, not quite a world first, but certainly an Australian first in that uh, it was a recreation of a generic workshop uh, or laboratory model inside the International Space Station. But what it did was that it actually rotated at a very particular speed so that it tricked your eye and made you feel disoriented in such a way that you felt like you were floating. So what we were doing with it was effectively creating a little sensation of uh, weightlessness even though that disorientation of weightlessness, even though you were standing on the ground in 1G. Um, so it was uh, it was quite an interesting experience um, adding that to our mix of, uh, of the exhibition and, and um, re-theming re the exhibition in various ways to talk about living and working in space. So, uh, you know, loads, of, it was great, it was loads of fun. How fascinating, how fascinating indeed. Um, how does your, your background with uh, curating space technology for museums and developing space exhibitions, how does that help you in your current role in outreach and heritage here at the Australian Space Agency? Well, it actually helps in a number of ways. Part of it is the fact that uh, as um, a curator, so not just an exhibition designer or developer, but someone who was responsible for creating a, a collection within the museum. And uh, that was another one of the things that I, I managed to do with the powerhouse was create effectively Australia's first significant space technology collection. Um, so as part of all of that, and you can see there I, I've noted some of the, the various skills that I was able to develop through working in, in, um, in the museum sector. I concentrated very much in my research on the history of Australian space activities. This is something that effectively was largely ignored by the 1980s because it, Australia hadn't really been active since the latter part of the, the 1960s into the early 70s, despite the fact that back in 1960, we were actually considered one of the most space active countries in the world, oh. which is something people don't realise now. So what I wanted to do was, was bring a lot of uh, awareness of that back into, um, you know, back to the Australian public. And so I wrote a book in 1992 with a co-author um, called Space Australia. 
that was the first time anybody had really put together a history of the all the variety of um, space related activities, not astronomy, because that's a, a separate area and uh, was actually very well documented. But nobody had really looked at our involvement with the work that was done out at Woomera, the work with the NASA tracking stations um, and a lot of research that had gone on in Australia. So I brought all of that together in, in Space Australia and actually 25 years later <laughs> was able to um, revisit that with a new book called Australia in Space. So to bring up uh, all the uh, the history and a lot more that I'd learned in the interim in, in uh, a new book called Australia in Space. Now, unfortunately, that came out about um, three or four weeks before the uh, Australian Space Agency's, uh, the plan to develop the Australian Space Agency was announced. So in fact, it's time for a new one. <laughs> A second edition, maybe. A second edition, that's right. And along the way, I got to do some other books, like a, a lovely children's book uh, through the powerhouse, Life in Space, which was a first reader that was based on the first mission, first flight of Andy Thomas, who uh, South Australians, I'm sure, will be very familiar, whose name they'll be very familiar with because he was the, um, the first Australian to become a permanent member of um, NASA's astronaut corps and fly in space. Um, in fact, I was very lucky uh, to be invited to his, uh, very privileged to be invited to his first launch in 1996. And so we based this Life in Space book on, on Andy's first first flight. How very, very interesting. You've, um, you've both lived through and studied the history of Australia in space. What are some of the most exciting developments in, in space for Australia that you've witnessed? Um, well, I mean, generally speaking, of course, the first moon landing was probably the most exciting event in space that occurred in my lifetime, apart from the launch of the very first satellite and the first person in space. Um, but from an Australian perspective, People old enough to remember will talk about the work that was done out at Woomera and they'll focus on the um, the large European program that took place out here in Australia. But apart from providing the, um, you know, the launch facility, we didn't have a lot of um, involvement in the development of the spacecraft or the launch vehicles at that time. So one of the things that I think is really interesting and, and again, hasn't had a lot of coverage was the Australian sounding rocket program. So we did an enormous amount of work through the 60s and into the 70s with small suborbital rockets being launched primarily out of Woomera that um, carried a whole range of instruments up into the, the upper atmosphere, which gave us a real insight for the first time, not just into the general characteristics of the upper atmosphere, but actually into the meteorology above Australia. So it really helped us to understand um, how weather develops above Australia. Um, of course, in the uh, we also Australia was one of the earliest nations to launch its own satellite. And people don't realise that in um, 1967 we launched a satellite called Resat, Weapons Research Establishment Satellite. And although that sounds like a rather um, militaristic name, that was because it was developed by the Weapons Research Establishment, which was the uh, government body that uh, is actually a um, the ancestor of Australia's uh, the current defence science and technology group that provides all the research for our defence sector, and the WRE actually managed the Woomera range. So, and, and in conjunction with the University of Adelaide, which had been working with the WRE on all the sounding rocket programs, they then took that expertise that they developed with the sounding rocket programs and applied them to the first uh, to our first satellite which is a lovely story in itself in that it was the united states that donated the launch vehicle to us so there was actually a there's actually another defense research program going on out at Woomera with the united kingdom and the united states and the americans have brought a number of uh, rockets out to Woomera for that particular programs as suborbital research program and they had one spare and they said well, we don't want to take it back to the united states if you want it you can have it um you know maybe you'd like to launch your own satellite and so that's that's how the program um got started and 
from that, Australia then became, you'll hear people tell you we were the third or the fourth. Um, it depends how you want to slice or define the char uh, what the characteristic is of being the first or whatever to do something. Um, I like to say that we're one of the earliest, but in terms of countries that had a satellite in space, we were the seventh. In terms of countries that actually launched their own satellite, we were fifth um, mm. after the US, oh sorry, the USSR, the United States, France, Italy, and then and then, then us. How fascinating. Well, uh, Australian space industry is just blossoming at the moment. So uh, yeah, hopefully we can get ourselves back up into the top five there when it comes to countries in space. Um, we're getting a couple of interesting questions coming through in the Q&A. Before I, I touch on them, I'd just like to go on to the next slide and, and just look a little bit more at, at um, some of what brought you to where you are at the moment, your, your professional career, some of your extracurricular activities. Um, and uh, you, you've done some, some work with uh, the IAF and uh, um, the IAA yeah, I is, became involved with the International Astronautical Federation and their International Astronautical Congresses from 1992. And I've developed a lot of uh, international connections there through uh, being member of different uh, member of different committees, particularly the Space Education and Outreach Committee and their Space Museums Committee. Um, associated with the IAF is the International Academy of Astronautics, and I've done again, been a member of quite a few of their committees, um, edited uh, volumes of uh, history that come out of their uh, history of uh, astronautics committee, um, and actually led to my being elected as a full member of the International Academy of Astronautics in, uh, in 2012, which is something I'm very proud of. Um, and I would point out too, for those who may be interested in 2025, the International Astronautical Congress, which is the biggest space gathering in the world every year, will be held in Sydney. So if you're really keen to uh, see the space community um, coming together in action, as it were, uh, you might actually want to consider uh, coming along to the uh, IAC in 2025, or certainly we'll have a huge outreach program that will be associated with that. So um, keep your eye out for things beginning to happen in the, in the latter half of 2025 and get involved, you know, wherever you can. I'm sure we'll be doing a lot of work uh, promoting that uh, when, when that comes around. Um, yeah. I just want to go to, to one of the questions we've had uh, sent online to us. Uh, you touched on the fact that you have found that your experience in some areas benefited you in other areas of your work. Could you give some examples that surprised you? Um, yes, the one, the one I love to use as an example actually is um, when I worked in the TAB call centre. I actually, as a student, I learned, learned to use a telex. And um, that might seem like, well, these days it's a rather outmoded skill, but it was very handy when I first went to work in the museum. Um, we were first developing the space exhibition. Uh, communicating with the Soviet Union was a bit of a challenge in those days because they didn't have uh, fax machines and they didn't have um, direct dial ISD phones. So you either had to sit on a, uh, through a, an operated connected call to make a phone call or send messages by, uh, by telex. And the museum didn't have its own telex, but the government department that we came under did have one. And so I was able to actually go up to the department uh, headquarters where the telex was and send our, send our own telexes without having to wait for them to, uh, to do it through the rather tedious departmental processes. So, I mean, that's a very minor example, and yet it was actually a very useful one at that uh, at that time. Um, through, in fact, through working uh, both in the TAB and the supermarket and in a shop, and uh, that actually helped me gain a wide level of experience in dealing with different people, different kinds of people in different situations. And I have found that very useful throughout my professional career, still useful, um, you know, still useful today, of course, you, you deal with a wide range of people in your work. Um, while I was working at the museum, I uh, became involved, obviously, in international negotiations with the Soviet Union, with China, to organise their contributions to the uh, the exhibition. 
and through that I, uh, you know, learned quite a lot about um, dealing with, uh, you know, with people in many countries and how to, uh, you know, how to approach, um, what's the word I want here? You know, how to bring um, different types of professional approaches to different circumstances to uh, mm. to get the best result and, you know, encourage people to, uh, uh, you know, to see that you were wanting to develop um, professional relationships that could be mutually beneficial. And so that's something that I've also brought to my work here at the uh, here at the agency. Oh, wonderful stuff. I think that's a great lesson for everybody is that no matter what you're doing in life, you can learn lessons from whatever experience you have and you can develop skills that can be transferable. Uh, I know personally, I, I don't have much of a background in space, but I have transferable skills from unrelated things like public speaking and, and radio work. Uh, and now being a massive space nerd, I get to utilize skills uh, doing something that I'm passionate about. Um, we do have a few more questions online, but before we get to those, um, could you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do at the Australian Space Agency? We might have a look at the next slide. Um, now that you are working here and, and we love having you here, can you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you do for us? Um, yeah, I uh, was fortunate to come into the agency again, a little bit like when I started the museum, as a uh, what was supposed to be a couple of months to assist in writing the state of space reports. Now, these are uh, the report to government um, that detail all the government involvement each year or over a period of perhaps 18 months, that detail all the Australian government activities in space. Um, you know, what each department has done, what they've achieved in the space sector and how that has um, measured up to the, the particular aims or goals that uh, uh, the government has set for not only the Australian Space Agency, but Australian um, space activities in general. Um, so because I had a lot of writing experience, both academically and uh, for popular reading, um, it was something that I was asked to come on board and, and take on for doing the very first one. And uh, from that, that led to my uh, becoming more involved with the development of the Australian Space Discovery Centre. Um, I uh, developed a small, uh, space, Australian space history exhibit for our headquarters here. But more broadly, um, I've been able to use the considerable experience that I gained at the powerhouse in outreach programs, public speaking, uh, you know, um, being a media commentator, all those kinds of things, to um, helping the agency's outreach programs. So uh, I've actually just thrown one little example of, of Raising the Bar there, that's a program that they have here in South Australia that um, is a bit, you know, like science in the pub kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've spoken in that program. Um, I work, of course, now with our Inspire program, which is specifically focused on making the public aware of why space matters, why it is that the agency exists, why um, the Australian government has uh, really focused on developing a space industry because of the various reliances that we have on space that people don't 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 really um, not really aware of. You know, space impacts our daily lives every day, and you probably don't even think of it. Um, if every satellite in the world was turned off tomorrow, though, um, the way we conduct our lives would be quite different. Um, you know, just think about what happens if you don't have GPS on your phone. <laughs> not only will you not be able to find where you're going, you won't be able to do your banking. You won't be able to do your online shopping. Um, you won't be able to see your future movies with lots of really great CGI in them. Um, the crops that they grow, that you you know, where your food comes from. Crops may not be quite so good next year because they're not, their health isn't being monitored from space. Um, you know, we won't be able to track bushfires. There are so many ways that we rely on space that we just don't think about, including in the national security areas. But uh, so, you know, my work involves um, helping to spread that word about why space matters. Also, of course, the reason the agency exists is to help develop an Australian space industry. And for the future of that industry, we need a workforce. So another part of my um, 
My role with the Inspire sector is to help grow that workforce by making people aware of the huge range of careers that are available for people in the space sector. So, you know, not not just rocket scientists and astronauts or engineers. Um, have you ever thought about being a space lawyer? Or a space, space communicator, maybe. Or a space economist or a space communicator, exactly. So, you know, there, there's a huge range of careers you can actually have in the space sector. And part of my role is helping to develop um, the resources that can go out to schools, to careers educators and so on, uh, to universities to help people, uh, young people realise that it's not just the STEM areas, although naturally we need lots of people to, uh, you know, be enthused by space and come into the STEM STEM careers that we will need for the future, but more broadly as well, all those other areas of space activity. So another thing that I'm able to do now is bring my experience as an exhibition developer into developing. Uh, we've created some small pop up exhibitions that um, you see one here in the lower sort of centre of this um, uh, this video. Uh, sorry, this slide where it says making space for Australia's future. And that's part of a, a little pop up exhibit that we've just put into the uh, visitor centre at the NASA um, Deep Space Communication Centre at uh, Tidbin Villa outside of Canberra. Lovely. I, 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 I want to touch on this future in space here a little bit as well. Uh, there's a saying that those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. What lessons from our history and space are important to keep in mind as we move into the future and what do you think that future holds for Australia? I think the lesson from the past that Australia has to bear in mind is that unfortunately we've had several false starts across um, you know, the last 50 years of governments that have decided that they would like to develop a space industry that, you know, Australia should become involved in the space sector in one way or another. And yet um, there hasn't been consistent support from government for the development of that sector. Now, this time we have a real opportunity and it's part of what is actually going to be Australia's future. We're now seeing a rapid growth, a really exciting growth of um, uh, space industry here in Australia. It's small at first, but we have a lot of niche um, capabilities that we can bring into the global space sector. And as long as we have that consistent um, level of, of support, we can move forward, help companies grow, help the sector grow, obviously bring more, um, you know, bring more more funds, more money into Australia. And um, I think, you know, some of the really exciting things we, we'll see in the distant future, well, not too distant future, I hope, you know, we're already planning to send a rover to the moon and that's wonderful in itself. I can't wait to see a little rover with an Australian flag on the moon. But what that does is demonstrate that Australia has a really world leading capability in remote operations. Um, and we already, as you, you may know, we already operate remind, uh, operate mines remotely <laughs> in mm -hmm. um, Western Australia from control centres that, that are in Perth. So we can take that expertise and extend it to operations on the moon. And that is something that we can then, um, Australia is, as a nation can be providing a, a special, um, uh, you know, form of expertise to the broader space sector for future space operations, whether it be in Earth orbit, um, on the moon, eventually maybe on Mars, maybe out to the asteroids. And they could all be little remotely controlled operated uh, vehicles operated from a control centre in, in Perth or Sydney or here in Adelaide or whatever. The sky is no longer the limit. Um, yeah, I think it's wonderful that we can have this re remote work in, in space, but I would be remiss if I did not mention that uh, recently uh, the Australian Space Agency announced Australia's first ever um, Australian space uh, astronaut candidate 
<clears throat> excuse me, to fly under the Australian flag. You, you mentioned people like Andy Thomas before, and we're very, very proud of Andy and everything that he has done. Uh, but he went up into space under an American flag, and Australia has our very first astronaut candidate, um, Catherine Bennell Pegg. She will be completing a year of basic training in Germany coming up, and then after that, she will be certified to do missions on the ISS, which we're very, very proud about. Yeah, oh, no, it's a really think... exciting development. Mm, so absolutely. Exciting. Do, do you think that Catherine's achievement paves the way for future Australian astronauts? In the longer term, yes, it will. In the shorter term, Catherine will come back. She doesn't immediately have a, a, a mission, obviously beyond her training. So she'll come back to Australia and she'll bring all that um, expertise and knowledge that she's acquired while working with the European Space Agency in her training. And that will inform where we might go in the future with an Australian um, astronaut program if we choose to develop one. But it can also help us um, actually understand a lot more about how to work with other space agencies on programs where maybe we don't have someone in space, but we've got one of our remotely operated um, pieces of equipment that an astronaut might be using either on the ISS or on the moon um, so that we'll, we'll sort of have, how can I put it, the expertise uh, or the experience of, of uh, understanding from the astronaut side as well as from our own um, experience in the remote operations side and also too it can help us um, understand Again, Australia has some niche expertise in various aspects of um, remote medicine, which is very applicable to the space medicine sector, especially for the longer term of operations beyond the Earth, on the moon and so on. And so again, some of what uh, Catherine learns during her training can come back and, and help further inform how our remote uh, medicine specialists might actually um, develop some of their expertise towards the uh, the space sector. I think it's great that we can take the flying doctors to uh, to the outer space doctors. I think that would be wonderful. Um, and now we've got about nine minutes left, so I'm going to go to a couple of questions that we have uh, online here. We've got a question for you. Why a space historian? Was it a huge career opportunity in the world space age or did you pave the way? Uh, in Australia, pretty much, certainly in terms of being a historian of Australian space activities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there there is actually a very good friend of mine here in Australia, Colin Burgess, whose books I would recommend to anyone who writes uh, wonderful space histories, but his work is focused on the American and uh, Soviet programs, particularly the human spaceflight programs. Um, and I, I mean, as I said, from the time I was a small child, I was fascinated with space. I wanted to learn everything about it, so my interests have covered everybody's space programs and all the things you can do in space. But one of the things that, you know, I was dearly fond of was the fact that Australia was doing it. When I was a kid, Australia was doing stuff in space. And I wanted to keep the memory of that alive. I say I, I lived through that. It was something that really was, was an inspirational part of my own childhood so that I was very interested in making sure that the awareness and knowledge of Australian space history um, was kept alive. And so that was part of what I was doing, obviously, through my um, professional career at the powerhouse. You know, I, I have a, a certain natural bent towards being interested in history, as well as being interested in what's happening now and, and what's happening in the future. Um, but particularly the, the idea of being an Australian space historian, technically, I think I'm still the one. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful a, achievement then. It's a fairly small field. <laughs> Um, well, that leads perfectly into another question here from Peter. Um, you've had such an extensive career. If you had to choose one major highlight, what would it be? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I hate being asked that question because <laughs> I truly, I hate being asked that question because I have had some very wonderful experiences. I've been very lucky to sometimes just be in the right spot at the right time. Um, so it's very hard in some ways to have a single highlight. I mean, obviously, um, when my first space exhibition was opened, that was a huge, huge highlight. Um, getting to see my first space shuttle launch, 
was an enormous highlight. As I mentioned, Andy, Andy Thomas um, did invite me to his first launch, and that was going as a guest of an astronaut. You're at the closest possible point you can be to watch uh, watch the launch. Um, so you have an you know an amazing view, and it was just just an incredible experience in itself. When the shuttle takes off. You know, you're dealing with an enormously powerful controlled explosion is essentially what a rocket launch is. And um, you see it take off. But of course, with the delay between the speed of light and the speed of sound, it takes those few moments more for the sound to come to you. And it comes across the water from the launch pad to where you're standing at Banana River. And it's like a rumble. And it is just visceral. The way that it hits you and shakes you, um, just just an experience. There is about, being in an earthquake is about the only other thing I can sort of say <laughs> gives you something of the sensation of the um, of the the rumbling of it, the vibration of it. I can only imagine what it would be like sitting on top of one of those, like inside the shuttle itself, and then feeling all of that below you. It, it must be incredible. Have you seen many launches, and and if so, do you have a favourite one? Well, I've been lucky enough to see three shuttle launches, um, all of which were, were Andy's. My favourite of those was probably his uh, second launch on his mission to the Mir space station, because that was a night launch. Ah. And that was really incredible because, you know, the, when, the, when those engines fire up, the solid rocket motors plus the main engines on the shuttle, the glow from that just lit up the sky. And in fact, it had been quite wet earlier in the day, so there's a lot of moisture in the air. And it was literally like the, the light was being refracted so much through all that moisture. It was like the shuttle was surrounded with a halo oh, as wow. it was taking off. It was the most incredible sight. So I think that's probably the, the highlight in terms of launches. Um, I have, have seen a sounding rocket launched out at Woomera one time, uh, one of the last ones actually back in the 90s when NASA had a a uh, small campaign they were operating out of Woomera. Um, launch of my, uh, well actually the launch of both my books was pretty special, pretty special highlights. Um, first time I met Neil Armstrong was actually, and the second time I met Neil Armstrong, <laughs> I, I, the wonderful privilege of meeting him twice. Um, and that was amazing. Uh, uh, yeah, sounds lovely. Um, so we're running out of time. I've got time for one last question. Um, and, and it's quite clear that from your life experience, you, you've had a, your finger in a number of pies, professionally speaking, um, that have led to you to where you are now. What advice would you give to someone looking to work in the space sector who may not have a traditional background in space or, or any work experience, but still wants to work in the space industry? Um. Look at what your skills are. Look at where they can be applied in the space sector. As I mentioned, there's a huge array of careers outside of being an engineer or a rocket scientist or an astronomer or an astronaut. Um, you know, to, in fact, if you want to be an astronaut, you don't have to be a pilot these days. Um, what if you want to work in the space sector generally? It's a good idea to take stock of what your skills are and see where they can fit into that much broader area of space careers. Now, I love to tell uh, when I'm talking to school kids who, who ask me, you know, how can I how can I be an astronaut? And this is the advice that I've actually heard astronauts give to young people who ask that question. And I think it's applicable across the whole, um, you know, whatever you want to do in your life. Uh, which essentially is find the thing that you love doing and get really good, you know, get good at that, um, develop um, a wide variety of skills that can be applicable to many different areas of, uh, of a professional career, but be doing it in doing something you love. And when you do that, you apply yourself to it. You be, you know, you have that enthusiasm and the drive that moves you forward to, to achieve in those, uh, in that career. And then, you know, as I say, look at how that's applicable to the space sector. Um, so what the astronauts will sort of say to you is that um, it's much better, don't try and, 
say, craft your career and do things that you think will make you an astronaut or that you think will get you into the space sector and then find they may not be the things you really want to do, but you think they'll get you there. And maybe they don't. You know, in 99.999% of cases, you won't become an astronaut much as you want to. I did and I haven't quite got there yet. <laughs> um, but you don't, you know, and so if you do things you don't want to do and then you don't make that final step to the career that you want, you could be caught in a career that you really don't like and be unhappy in your life. But if you're doing the things that you love and then you manage to add the space bit onto it, you know, that's that's the perfection. But if you're doing the things that you love and you don't manage to add the space bit onto it, you've still got a career that you really enjoy. I think that's wonderful advice for, for everybody listening, whether you're listening live to us at the moment or you're watching us uh, uh, later on on the internet. Um, Kerry, we are out of time, but thank you so much for giving us just such a, a wonderful storied view of, of history throughout the Australian space industry and your own personal career. Uh, a truly fascinating individual to talk to, and we're very grateful to have you with us today. Thank you very much, and thank you to everybody that, that has uh, jumped online. Um, stay tuned, we will be having more Q and A with space experts uh, coming up in future weeks. Kerry Doherty, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.